good evening all uh, topic on allergic conjunctivitis yeah what is allergic conjunctivitis it's an inflammation of conjunctiva or hypersensitive reactions which may be immediate or delayed uh, to some specific antigens this is the pathology uh, when there is a initial contact with pollen or allergen any allergen uh, interleukin 4 acts b lymphocytes to produce ige which fixes to the mast cell this ige fixed to mast cell when there is subsequent exposure or contact with pollen or allergen then there will be degranulation then it results in the results of inflammatory mediators then the patient develops allergic reaction and the signs and symptoms appear allergic conjunctivitis is a type 1 hypersensitive reaction mediated by degranulation of mast cell in response to action of ige and it is also an element of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction in at least some forms so these are the types as ma'am discussed uh, simple allergic conjunctivitis which, which include seasonal allergic conjunctivitis perineum and also vernal and atopic keratoconjunctivitis first let us uh, simple allergic conjunctivitis it's a mild non specific type 1 hypersensitivity reaction mediated by ige and it occurs due to exposure of ocular surface to airborne allergens like pollens and this is seen in younger children spring or summer season acute itching and watering being the common symptoms but the hallmark is chemosis which gives worry to parents treatment is not usually required and conjunctival swelling settles within hours as the acute increase in vascular permeability results then difference between the seasonal allergic conjunctivitis and the perennial allergic conjunctivitis seasonal allergic conjunctivitis also known as hay fever eyes which is worse during spring and summer season and seasonal allergic conjunctivitis is more common than a perennial allergic conjunctivitis and the most frequent allergens are tree and grass pollens and the, this seasonal allergic conjunctivitis will manifest as acute allergic conjunctivitis in perennial which is less common and the symptoms throughout the year and worse during autumn the most frequent allergens are house dust animal dander and mites and the onset is subacute or chronic in nature so pathological features include vascular response cellular and conjunctival response first let us see the response which is characterized by sudden and ex extreme vasodilation and increased permeability of vessels leading to exudation in cellular response it is a form of conjunctival infiltration and exudation in the discharge of eosinophils plasma cells and the mast cells producing histamine and the conjunctival response in the form of boggy swelling of conjunctiva followed by increased connective tissue formation and mild papillary hyperplasia this include transient acute or subacute attacks of redness watering itching associated with the sneeze and the nasal discharge conjunctival hyperemia with relatively mild papillary reaction variable chemosis and the lit edema are present investigations are generally not performed although conjunctival scraping in more active cases may demonstrate the presence of abundant eosinophils then to treatment if possible allergen can be eliminated artificial tears for milder symptoms mast cell stabilizers like sodium chromoglycate nedochromyl sodium must be used for few days before exerting a maximal effect anti histamines like imidastin epinastin bepotastin can be used for the symptomatic exacerbations and effective as mast cell stabilizers dual action of anti histamine and mast cell stabilizers like azelastin ketotifen act rapidly and are often very effective for exacerbations nsaids like diclofenac can provide symptomatic relief but rarely used topical steroids are also effective but are rarely necessary and oral histamines like diphenhydramine loratadine can be given for severe symptoms and these are the available topical medications the histamine blocker mainly it blocks the h1 receptor because the h1 induces or increases the vascular permeability uh, the drugs like epinastin 0.05% amidastin levocabastin ketotifen are histamine blockers and the mast cell stabilizer include chromoline sodium 2% 4% and nedochromyl 2% lodoxamide 0.1% pemidolas 0.1 and spaclomid 1% and the dual action which includes histamine blocker and the mast cell stabilizer alkaftadine 0.25 azelastin 0.05 bipotastin 1.5 olapatadine frequently is 0.1 and 2% mild steroids lotiprid and fluoromethylone prednisolone can be used and the strong prednisolone 1% 
dexamethasone can be used nafasolin vasoconstrictor can be used and nsaids like ketorolac diclofenac and indomethacin 1% can be used coming to vernal correcto conjunctivitis uh, which is a recurrent bilateral disorder in which both ige and cell mediated immune mechanism play important roles and it primarily affects boys and the onset is generally from age of about 5 years onwards and there is a remission by the late teens in 90, 95% of the cases the peak incidence is over late spring and summer season symptoms include intense ocular itching burning sensation foreign body sensation mild photophobia lacrimation stingy discharge and increased blinking signs include palpable disease limbal disease and the mixed form in the palpable disease it primarily involves upper tarsal conjunctiva a conjunctival hyperemia diffuse papillary hypertrophy can be seen superior tarsal plate macro papillae less than 1 mm have flat top polygonal up, which reminiscent of cobblestones focal or diffuse whitish inflammatory infiltrates may be seen in the intense disease giant papillae more than 1 mm and there may be a mucus deposition between these papillae the picture shows a, a macro papillae and the mucus deposition also the limbal disease gelatinous limbal conjunctiva papillae that may be associated with transient apically located white cellular collections like horner trantas dots in tropical regions limbal disease may be very severe and these are the gelatinous membrane around the limbus keratopathy uh, which is more frequent in palpable disease superior punctate epithelial erosions associated with the layer of mucus on the superior cornea and epithelial macro erosions can be seen plate and shield ulcers in palpable or mixed disease when exposed bowman membrane becomes coated with mucus and the calcium phosphate leading to inadequate wetting and delayed re-epithelialization to prevent secondary bacterial infection this picture shows a shield ulcer sub-epithelial scars that are typically gray and oval which may affect vision pseudogerontoxone can develop in recurrent limbal disease and the paralimbal band of superficial scarring resembling arcus senilis. Peripheral superficial vessel ingrowth is common superiorly. Keratoconus and other forms of corneal ectasia is common due to persistent eye rubbing. The eyelid, eyelid disease is usually mild. Bonini classification of EKC based on signs and symptoms. It includes grade 0 to grade 5. Grade 0, it's a question disease and there may be no symptoms and only mild to moderate papillary reaction grade one is mild intermittent and has mild symptoms mild to moderate papillary reaction and conjunctival hyperemia grade two includes grade 2a and grade 2b grade 2a moderate intermittent mild to moderate symptoms daily activity affected and moderate to severe papillary reactions can be seen in grade 2a these are intermittent uh, symptoms Grade 2B, moderate persistent, mild to moderate persistent symptoms with or without SPKs. Grade 3, severe, moderate to severe persistent symptoms, uh, SPKs are present and with or without trantas dots. Grade 4 is very severe persistent symptoms, trantas dots and corneal erosion ulcer can be present. And the grade 5, mild or absent symptoms. So grade 2B to grade 5, it includes a persistent symptoms. Yeah, Vignesh, let's wait here. Yes, no. So, uh, just to summarize what Vignesh has said, when we talk about VKC, uh, so primarily in seasonal and perennial conjunctivitis, as I said, you will see a conjunctival congestion and minimal papillary reaction in addition to the symptom of itching and redness and watering that the patient will have. Okay. When we come to VKC, the patient will have a complaint of constant itching. It, again, it could be seasonal or perennial based upon how severe is the VKC and the patient might complain of photophobia, watering, redness. Can anybody tell me why will the patient have photophobia and VKC? I want some PG to answer that question. Maybe due to epithelial erosion. Excellent Vignesh, very good. So it's because of the superficial punctate keratitis that the patient develops photophobia. So that means that if the patient is complaining of photophobia, the patient has a corneal involvement. Okay. Then what is the next sign that you will see in these patients? 
you will have this is the uh, this is a symptom when we come to the sign you will have conjunctival how will you differentiate between active and inactive ek can uh, yeah vansh can you tell us uh, how will you differentiate whether it is an active or an inactive ek that we are dealing with ma'am uh, the presence of uh, limbal papillae uh, uh, will uh, tell us whether it is an active or a uh, chronic Uh, See, as a rule, you know, I always tell fellows and everybody, PGs, that start from either outside to inside or inside to outside, so that you don't miss out on any particular sign or symptom that you're talking about. So when you're talking about an active disease or an inactive disease, start from the lids. Yes. Then yes. conjunctiva, then limbus, then cornea, or go from cornea, limbus, conjunctiva, lids. So, uh, ma'am, uh, the palpebral conjunctiva. uh mm-hmm. papillae can be there uh, in a chronic phase also uh, so that will so will papillae be present in all kinds of ekc do you have a ekc where the palpable papillae might not be present on that question comes what are the types of ekc that we know of not sure ma'am uh, i'm i don't know ma'am types of ekc ma'am mm, what are the types of ekc Like the anatomical location. Can you tell me what are the types of VKC? Ma'am, limbal VKC, ma'am, bulbar mm-hmm. VKC. I... Limbal VKC and yes, limbal. Bulbar and limbal is the same, no? Yes, ma'am. Limbal and limbal and bulbar VKC, ma'am. Ma'am, limbal palpebral and this form. Palpebral. Can I tell me? Okay. Limbal and palpebral and there is a mixed form. Correct. So you have limbal VKC, you have palpebral VKC, and you have mixed VKC. Limbal VKC will have primarily the involvement of the limbus and the bulbar conjunctiva. Palpebral VKC might have symptoms only in the palpebral conjunctiva, where the patient will only have large papillae or papillary reaction. The bulbar conjunctiva will be absolutely quiet. And next you have is a mixed VKC, so where you will have both a palpebral and a limbal component present. Okay, Vansh. So when you're talking about uh, papillary con- uh, papillary reaction in the tarsal conjunctiva, that can be present in a mixed variety or in a tarsal conjunctiva. You might have a limbal VKC where there is no tarsal. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Next, what else? Ma'am, uh, bulbar conjunctiva, the patient will have congestion. Very good. Uh, and uh, circumcorneal congestion. Uh, circumcorneal congestion i don't want to get into that circumcorneal congestion so i am not going that line yes sir hmm? uh, what else he just showed you some pictures uh, anybody else want to help vansh pgs from horner trantor spots excellent what are horner trantor's dot spots from their um, gelatinous accumulation Gelatinous, okay. Their limbal conjunctiva, um, their accumulation of cell cellular debris. I'm not sure. Anybody else wants to help her? I'm aggregates of uh, eosinophils and uh, epithelial cells, basically. Very good. So that indicates activity again. If you have HT dots, it means that the disease is active. Eosinophils will never come in an inactive stage of the disease. Correct. So you will get papillary reaction. You will have a bulbar congestion. You might have HT dots. Then you might have limbal papillae. Then what else? On the cornea. Some HT cornea involvement. Hmm. Epithelial erosions, ma'am. Hmm. Very good. And what else? Some HT ulcer. Very good. Shield ulcer. Shield ulcer. Very, good. Shield ulcer. Very good. So why is it called shield ulcer? Shield okay. Can you describe a shield ulcer? Is it infected? Is it non-infected? It's non-infective, ma'am. Very good. Uh, and associated with patients who have VKC, and mm-hmm. they have usually peripheral corneal involvement. Okay. And uh, so, does shield ulcer come in an active stage of the disease, or it is in the inactive stage of the disease? Ah, uh, active stage, ma'am. Correct. Any idea what causes a shield ulcer? From the palpable conjunctival. From the palpable involvement, can cause what palpable involvement? The palpable papillae. 
correct so they can cause erosions i'm not sure but you they talking about the mechanical rubbing so the large yeah. cobblestone papillae on the tarsal conjunctiva will cause a mechanical rubbing of the cornea and cause a shield ulcer anything okay. else that can cause a shield ulcer so if i say i have a patient of limbal ekc uh does that rule out uh that he or she will never get a shield ulcer no ma'am so what can what is the other factor that can cause a shield ulcer i want one rubbing ma'am huh? constant rubbing limbal vkc i'm talking about tarsal mein to kuch nahi hai so what constant rubbing will cause ma'am svkc multiple svkc can cause that shield so, ulcer how will multiple svkc cause shield ulcer what is it that is released Uh, because you people are cornea fellows nikhil i want a little more from you people what is it there in limbal vkc which is released which causes shield ulcers so there are two components right by yeah, limbal forming here is my question if i have a tarsal vkc which is active i know that my cobblestone papillae is rubbing on the cornea and causing an spk in my limbal vkc why should i get an spk is my question uh limbal papillae are there which are raised and that's uh, causing the Why limbal papillae will cause VKC? Ah, uh, why limbal pap papillae will cause ah uh, SPK? Ah, uh, tear film ah uh, distribution won't be even, and that's how the SPK is. Like total fake, Nikhil. Mom, did you do a serialization? No. So in the limbal VKC or the limbal disease, you will most of these patients will have HT dots. these hd dots in addition to having eosinophil deposits release epithelial toxic proteins like your epithelial basic protein and epithelial toxic proteins these epithelial toxic proteins cause superficial punctate keratitis which in turn fuse together to form a shield ulcer so shield ulcer has two arms one is the mechanical which is the constant rubbing and two is the inflammatory component which is why you get the deposition of fibrin So shield ulcer has different grades, right? This ulcer that we saw in this patient had a thick coat of a fibrin plaque sitting on it. So that is an inflammatory deposit which is going and sitting on the ulcer. So that is because of the inflammation, which is very severe. Uh, you have a fibrin plaque which goes and gets deposited. But the reason it forms is because of the epithelial toxic proteins which are released from the limbal papillae or the HT dots which are present at the limbus. that is why you will get spks and uh, and shield ulcer uh, in a few of these patients uh, he spoke about epithelial scar sub epithelial scar can tell me can somebody tell me why will you get a sub epithelial scar we just spoke about this condition ma'am uh, due to yes. healing of shield ulcer yeah 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 ma'am i was thinking something else i think correct <laughs> once a shield ulcer heals it will leave behind a scar that is what we are talking about sub epithelial scarring then he is talking about superficial vascularization what is the superficial vascularization it can be in form of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency excellent why do you get limbal stem cell deficiency gaurav <coughs> more in the limbal uh, this uh, limbal disease ma'am because of the uh, repeated uh, this inflammation uh. very good so lscd is more commonly seen in a patient with limbal vkc because of the chronic inflammation of the limbus causing a limbal stress you can also see it in a mixed vkc or a tarsal vkc the incidence is obviously very less in tarsal as compared to a limbal because in limbus that's the primary site of inflammation so the superficial vascularization that we are talking about in a patient with vkc is actually an early lscd or a feature of lscd which occurs because of chronic inflammation of the limbus altering its function right then what is the other stage why do they develop keratoconus the two complications that we talk about in vkc so when we talk about complication in vkc we can divide it into two arms one is the disease related and one is treatment related can somebody tell me what will be the treatment related complications of vkc can long term due to the chronic use of steroids when the cataract and glaucoma can happen excellent develop. and what is the disease related complication of vkc mm. mom keratoconus uh, due to the constant rubbing mm -hmm. and um, as uh, we discussed lscd can be there correct corneal mm -hmm. scar correct so these are the complications of the disease that is vkc per se so keratoconus lscd uh, uh, sub epithelial scarring are all related to the disease and 
steroid induced cataract or steroid response resulting in glaucoma are the treatment related uh, problems so this is in broad the signs and symptoms of vkt what is the discharge that we see in these patients vignesh can you talk uh, tell us what is the discharge that we see in these patients ma'am it's ropey discharge rope like discharge why is there a ropey discharge i want one of the fellows to take this i reached okay cool so why do they have ropey discharge okay what will cause a ropey discharge what will cause a ropey discharge sir what all are the cells so what is vkc it is a all these are conjunctival disorders correct we are talking about allergic conjunctivitis so the disease the the primary tissue at fault here is the conjunctiva correct so priyanka what are the what are the glands or things in conjunctiva which release a particular thing what are the secretions that we see from conjunctiva what are the different glands present in the conjunctiva coagulant cells very good what do they release mucus mucin silent then what else is there conjunctival glands sebaceous glands ma'am releasing sebum okay mm-hmm. what else in the conjunctiva okay what are accessory lacrimal glands accessory mm-hmm. accessory lacrimal glands wolfring okay. and crossing correct so now you tell me which of these glands secretion Will result in a ropey discharge. Yeah, coagulant cells. Correct. So there is a hyper secretion of mucin during VKC, which is why you get a ropey discharge in VKC. Correct. Okay? Obviously, right? If your accessory lacrimal glands are hyper functioning, you will have water. You will not have a ropey discharge. It's the mucin which is getting secreted excessively, which is why you see that ropey discharge in these patients of VKC. Hmm? What is allergic shyness? Any PG can tell me what is that? Ma'am, due to constant rubbing of the eyes, there is a uh, allergic shy. One is allergic shyness, and one more was there. So uh, this is uh, related with uh, chronic sinusitis and uh, 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 and conjunctivitis as well. Right. So there, there is increased pigmentation around your. Eyes, very ocular skin. Correct. And there's one more very classical feature. Most of these patients with allergic conjunctivitis will also have very uh, long eyelashes. Again, a nature's way to prevent their eye from dust, mud entering the eye. Uh, you know, to protect uh, from the dust and mud so that they don't the frequency of these episodes decrease. Most of these patients somehow will have very long eyelashes. So now, how do you differentiate between active and inactive? We will have presence of conjunctival congestion. papillary reaction hd dots limbal papillae spks shield ulcer patient complaining of constant itching redness watering photophobia all these are signs and symptoms telling us of an active disease presence of only what else can you tell me will what else will tell us that the disease is inactive uh, sorry what are the factors which will tell us that the disease is inactive all the opposite right so if the eye is quiet there is no congestion the child is asymptomatic if you have a flat cobblestone papillae which is not taking up stain in the center there is no conjunctival congestion there is no spks all these are symptoms to tell you that the disease is inactive now the bonini's classification is based upon these signs and symptoms that you see in the active stage of the disease if there is a corneal involvement the grades become severe if there is no corneal involvement the grades are still mild to moderate this is how uh, this is what basically the bonini's classification tells you So grade one and two are all milder grades with no corneal involvement. Once the cornea starts getting involvement, it is the uh, moderate to severe, which is grade two B and above. Okay, yeah, Vignesh. Let's move on to the next part, the treatment. The treatment based on disease severity, as we said, grade zero is a quiescent, uh, no treatment, and grade one is mild, intermittent. We can use occasional anti-allergic eye drops and lubricant when necessary. Okay. So Vignesh, I want you to go back to that first table that you had put of antihistaminics and mast cell stabilizers. So, which of my fellows are going is going to take up? So my question is, why uh, is histamine blocker and mast cell stabilizer no longer the drug of choice when we deal with patients with VKC? One, two, three points. Who is going to give me? Mm-hmm. Ma'am, uh, the reasons. One of the reasons is the drugs we have now, the first line, are acting as a dual uh, actor, which are antihistaminics plus mast cell stabilizing activity too, like olopatadine group. So, 
that is more proficient and efficient compared to the master stabilizer alone why because ma'am they have dual action master stabilizer only will stop the degranulation and won't act against the histamine which is released so uh, olopat component will have this dual action against histamine and also it will uh, prevent the uh, also it will cause master stabilization so the dual action okay so my question is why is histamine blocker fallen out of use why don't we commonly use ketotiophene epinastine why are these drugs fallen out of choice in the active stage of the disease if we just use a histamine blocker ma'am it won't act on the histamine which uh, it won't uh, act at the root cause and it won't stop the thing it will only act temporarily to the histamine which is already being released and because uh, uh, the histamine is not only the uh, mediator which is released mm -hmm. and also there is a h1 uh, blocker mam whereas an ocular h2 is also there okay so actually speaking on our conjunctiva what are the how many receptors of histamine what are the different types of histamine receptors identified in the conjunctiva so we have four types of histamine receptors h1 2 3 and 4 So these are the four histamine receptors which are identified in the conjunctiva, and the uh, the population of all of them in are known to increase during allergic conjunctivitis. Most of these antihistamines or the histamine blockers that are available are H1 blockers. They do act sometime on the H2 and sometime on H3, but their uh, action on all the other uh, histamine receptors is negligible. So most of them, what is available in the market, are primarily H1 blockers. so as gaurav very beautifully mentioned that once a mast cell degranulates it is not just histamine but it is also basophils neutrophils multiple other uh, inflammatory mediators which are released so just giving a histamine blocker even in patients with seasonal or perennial allergic conjunctivitis doesn't really help because one that is not the only inflammatory mediator which is released two the receptor that it acts on is primarily only h1 whereas in the conjunctiva you have three other uh, histamine receptors which are present which are happy and functioning if you have just given an h1 block correct so that is why histamine blocker is no longer used then next comes next comes your mast cell stabilizer when does the role of mast cell stabilizer come into play what is the mechanism um, they inhibit the degranulation of the mast cells and uh, they should be given before the allergy or the exposure to the allergen correct excellent so that is one thing one that it has to be given before the activity starts and not during the episode of activity the other factor is uh the conjunctival receptor on which your mast cell stabilizer acts your muscarinic receptors on which these uh mast cell stabilizer act the ratio in the normal conjunctiva between m1 and m2 muscarinic receptors reverses when it becomes a diseased conjunctiva that is in vkc so the muscarinic receptor on which your chromolin sodium or your mast cell stabilizer act the population actually decreases when you have a vkc so which further reduces its role and its importance in managing patients with vernal keratotic conjunctivitis because the receptor on which it actually acts the density of that reduces when the when the disease is active in a normal conjunctiva the population of muscarinic receptor m1 is more as compared to m2 but it becomes reversed when it is a vkc so again reducing the role of mast cell stabilizer in managing a patient of vkc which is why the dual action have taken over your histamine blockers and mast cell stabilizers now we have these multiple drugs that are available that is elcaftadine azelastin honestly speaking there is no study to tell us which one is better than the other we have increased concentrations available now of oloparidine as well so to each one its choice whichever is available and you know based upon how the patient profile is what the patient has been using you can switch the drugs but we really don't know which one is better than the other elcaftadine is supposedly a little more um uh you know broader acting than oloparidine especially when it comes to histamine receptors as well but we really don't know so uh let's move on to your uh, table of the treatment yeah so so this just gives you the gist so if you have a patient of vkc who comes to you with a milder form of the disease where it is only seasonal he tells you during summer holidays i have so these patients you tell them that before summer start one month prior they can start off using olopatadine or any other dual acting that you are prescribing or you are comfortable with the patient can start off even a month prior so that when the 
peak season starts, the child is much more comfortable. Otherwise, also during the period of activity, you can give them a low dose topical steroid along with a dual acting agent. What is the role of lubricants in these patients? Any idea? Have to wash away the toxins. Correct. So lubricants, refreshed tears, is only to wash away the allergen that is present in the eye so that it reduces the load in the eye. Correct. Then, if the patient comes to you with a perineal form, that you know you are not able to get the patient off the topical steroids, is when you should start thinking about the disease. Now, is the patient that you're dealing with has only an ocular component of allergy, or are there any other factors that are contributing to that allergy? So, start looking at the inciting factors. Does the patient have any history of allergic rhinitis? Does the patient have any associated atopic dermatitis? Does the patient have any pet? Has the patient moved to a new location? Uh, has the patient moved, you know, moved to a more dusty place? There is any change of climate that has happened. Like, you know, the, earlier the child was in, in an area which was hot and now he's moved to a hilly area or vice versa, you know. So try and see whenever you're dealing with a patient with a perineal conjunctivitis, what are, is there an inciting factor associated? And before you do that, it is also important to understand whether the patient really has a perineal conjunctivitis or no. Sometimes these patients, even with itching on and off or a redness, you know, they'll have redness for a couple of hours, which will settle down later. But the parents are so sensitive about that that they will say, Ki pure saal bhar uska aankh lal rehta hai. which is actually not the case. It's just that the child goes out to school, comes back, the eye is red for a couple of hours and after which it settles down. That does not put the child into a perineal conjunctivitis. Perineal conjunctivitis, patients will have constant watering, photophobia, redness, HT dots, SPKs throughout the year. Little bit of redness, little bit of itching is something that these kids have to live for the rest of their life. That does not put them into perineal. So first, make sure that it is a perineal disease and it is not an exaggeration of symptoms uh, that the parents and the child is understanding or, uh, you know, they're inarbitrarily using topical steroids for. Once you're sure that it is persistent, Try to look for inciting factors. If you find nothing, you know, if there is no other problem that the child has, then you can start the patient on topical steroids, continue with your uh, dual acting agents and put the patient on an immunomodulator like your cyclosporin or your tacrolimus and gradually get the patient off the topical steroids. This is for a normal uh, VKC patient. But if you have a perineal form where you have a large cobblestone papillae sitting on the tarsal uh, conjunctiva, which is not responding to any of your treatment modalities, then you will have to think about management options for managing this papillae separately. Now, can somebody, one of the Ikonia fellows tell me the different ways of managing uh, or step ladder management for uh, papillary management, tarsal Papillary management. Ma'am, apart from the medical management which is being started, uh, if the papillae are giant or there, the intralesional steroids, the traditional it can be used as well. How does that act? What is its mechanical action? Ma'am, um, it acts as a local uh, anti-inflammatory there and so it causes cicatrization and the papillary regress. Uh, not the cicatrization, as in the local anti-inflammatory, so inflammation settles down, so no more the the papillae, the activity and the papillae and the size uh, does it get acts bigger. like a depot. Whatever you give yeah, yeah, yeah. the steroids, like a depot. One of those it is acting like a depot. So it is constantly releasing the steroid over there locally where the disease is active and trying to bring down the immune mediated reaction. Second, second, uh, if uh, the papillae are too large and too many, like a big cobblestone papillae, not getting regressed. Then the mucous membrane grafting uh, that is, is still perfect. time before mucous membrane grafting. After supratarsal, you de- as you have given supratarsal, three months later the patient comes to you with a recurrence. Then what will you do? We can so again give a repeat dose of injection as a depot again, ma'am. In that case, that is not working. Then what? And cryotherapy. Very good. How does cryotherapy work, Divya? Uh, so cryotherapy, what we actually do is we uh, apply the cryotherapy to the uh, center of the papillae where the vascular core is. So it causes uh, local uh, ischemic uh, necrosis in that area to um, basically uh, it that vascular core is uh, treated and it helps to uh, flatten down the papillae. So it causes, what is a papillae? Papillae is a proliferation around a vascular pedicle, cool. right? You have a new... 
uh, you have a new vessel around which there is inflammatory mediators which collect and they form a papillae. Now, if you cause an ischemia or a necrosis of that blood vessel, automatically that papillae will resolve, correct? Yes. So then what else does it cause? One, it causes an ischemic necrosis of the papillae. How does it prevent a recurrence? What else does cryotherapy cause? Fibrosis. Very good. It induces scarring and fibrosis. Scarring. Which is why the recurrence of the papillae should reduce. Now, that brings me to another question. Can somebody tell me why don't we get we, we get papillae where? In the tarsal conjunctiva and at the limbus. Correct? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Why don't we get papillae anywhere else in the conjunctiva? Like, why don't we get it in the bulbar conjunctiva, Gaurav? Uh, ma'am, in these places, the uh, conjunctiva is adhered to the underlying tissue, ma'am, in the uh, tarsus and uh, uh, here in the limbus. So, ma'am, uh, so this is the localized accumulation which is uh, forming the papillae, whereas the other conjunctiva is uh, freely mobile, so we don't get such accumulation. Correct. So, even if the inflammatory mediators are collecting in the bulbar conjunctiva, because it is redundant and loose, there is no accumulation which is focal and localized, which will result or pop out like a swelling. Whereas in the tarsal conjunctiva, you have septae, which is dividing the conjunctiva and the tarsal conjunctiva is anchored to your tarsal plate by those septae, which is why a localized proliferation of the inflammatory mediators results in formation of a cobblestone papillae there. In the limbus also, the conjunctiva is coming in strongly getting adherent to the limbus, which is why again, a collection of the inflammatory mediators causes a papillary reaction at the limbus. But you don't see that in the bulbar conjunctiva, correct? So like the Vya said, the, uh, the cryotherapy is also further going to cause scarring. Now, because it is causing scarring, you wouldn't expect a recurrence to occur in the area where there is scarring because then again, it will not let the uh, tissue over there proliferate. Okay. Now, what if after cryotherapy also it uh, there is a recurrence? Ma'am, like Nikhil said, the mucous membrane grafting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Now that you've made a video, like you want, you only uh, you know, put forth those points. So how does mucous membrane grafting help? And what do you mean when you say mucous membrane grafting? What is done actually? Uh, so what we do is uh, in the uh, in the tarsal conjunctiva, first we uh, excise the area of the uh, we excise the superficial part uh, to remove the papillae, which is causing the friction on the ocular surface and the cornea. And we take a mucous membrane graft from the uh, lower lip and uh, we make it as thin as possible uh, so that uh, and then we place it over the area of the where we have removed the uh, tarsal conjunctiva, uh, place it there and um, secure it with fibrin glue. Uh, so basically what we're doing is uh, the uh, we are reducing the friction and creating a smooth surface uh, to prevent uh, friction between the upper lid and the uh, in the cornea and the ocular surface and uh, also helps in reducing the inflammation. So one is the mechanical component, okay, that you have excised the papilla. But then for that mechanical component, I could have just excised the papilla and put an AMT, no? Why am I doing all that? Uh, why am I taking all that trouble of harvesting the mucosa? How is the mucosa helping me over there? So the mucosa is, uh, there are certain properties of the mucosa that also help. The mucosa itself has goblets. Ma'am, there are certain properties of the mucosa that also helps to reduce the inflammation and uh, I'm not, uh, I don't remember exactly what. Anybody else wants to help her? Nikhil, you want to help her? Ma'am, the AMT won't be uh, taking care of that raw surface in the lid area, ma'am. The AMT what? won't. <laughs> As in the AMT properly with mucous the membrane has more pliability and it goes along with No, the... no, no. Q, uh, chemical injuries, may we don't put AMT on the tarsal conjunctiva. We do, ma'am, but... I'll do a good job, trust me. I'll stick it properly, Nikhil. It'll not come out. Then, what are the properties that Divya is talking about? Anybody ma else? The mucus... Hmm, uh, mucus membrane is uh, not uh, uh, prone to the allergic... Uh, uh, reactions from excellent like. it is an immune tolerant tissue one two how many of it provides a smooth surface more resilient to the micro trauma huh? more uh, why are we thinking of micro trauma here Priyanka? no i mean it doesn't who's averting your lid and causing trauma what else one as gaurav rightly pointed out anybody else the pgs want to take a shot just guess Nish, did you read anything about it anybody else Vansh? Any guess, random guess, no problem. What happens is, has anybody heard ever of 
uh, oral allergy you will hear, hear of asthma you will hear of skin allergy you will hear of eye allergies but we never hear about oral allergies right so as gorov pointed out oral mucosa is an immune tolerant tissue so we are replacing a diseased tissue with an immune tolerant tissue one second vkc as such is a conjunctival disorder correct so what we are doing here is we are re- reducing the diseased tissue and replacing it with an immune tolerant tissue so we are reducing the bulk of the conjunctiva which is there in the eye and replacing it with another tissue which is immune tolerant we are replacing it with a tissue which is not going to be replaced by a conjunctiva so it's not that the oral mucosa is going to get conjunctival if i excise the conjunctiva if i excise these papillae and i put an amt it will get conjunctivalized right so that conjunctiva will come back again so which is why just excising the papillae and putting an amt is not going to help because that conjunctiva is going to come back so my diseased tissue is not going to get uh the loop disease tissue is not coming down so that will again once it gets conjunctivalized it will again respond to the allergic stimuli the way it did here my diseased conjunctiva is getting replaced with another tissue which will not respond to the allergic stimuli the way uh, a normal tissue a normal conjunctiva does so that is how you move the spectrum grafting so this is how so first you will try a supratarsal tricoid if it doesn't help then you go in for a, a cryotherapy if that doesn't help then you go in for an excision with a mucous membrane graft and before all this you can also try short courses of oral steroids to see if that helps in these uh, management of these papillae okay yeah vignesh let's go ahead advantages of this bonini grading system i think we can we can skip this vignesh we have finished with the any any doubts anybody has up till now till vkc ma'am oral antihistaminics or uh, oh, yes. give hmm and do we give for uh, vkc patients see again much the same thing no that again the role of oral antihistaminics is extremely limited so as an ophthalmologist we don't prescribe oral antihistaminics if the patient has an allergic rhinitis or an allergic uh, systemic disorder for which the pediatrician wants to give them some systemic anti allergic that is a different story okay because oral antihistaminics also have the same limitation they also again don't act on all the uh, anti uh, all the h1 uh, all the uh, histamine receptors that are uh, there in the body okay ma'am chal now let's move to pkc atopic character conjunctivitis is a rare bilateral disease that typically develops in adulthood with peak incidence of 30 to 50 years uh, it has a long history of atopic dermatitis and asthma there is no gender predominance akc tends to be chronic and unremitting vkc is more frequently seasonal and generally worse in the spring but akc tends to be annual and is often worse in the winter Eosinophils tend to be less common in conjunctival scrapings than with v- symptoms and signs similar to those of VKC, but are frequently more severe and unremitting. Coming to eyelids, skin changes are prominent than in VKC and typically eczematite, erythema, redness, scaling, and thickening are present, and is associated with chronic staphylococcal blepharitis and madrosis are common. There may be characterization of the lip margin. and hetox sign absence of lateral portion of the eyebrow then in our lip skin folds due to persistent rubbing lower lip ectropia and epiphora coming to the conjunctival involvement preferentially inferior palpable whereas in vkc it is worse superiorly discharge is more watery than stingy mucoid discharge in vkc hyperemia papillae are initially smaller than in vkc larger lesions may develop later diffuse conjunctival infiltration scarring are present secretorial structural changes uh, in which moderate symblephron formation for initial shortening and keratinization of carinkel are seen limbal involvement is similar to vkc no no nothing continue continue keratopathy uh, punctate epithelial erosions over the inferior third of cornea are common uh, peripheral vascularization and stromal scarring are more common than in vkc persistent epithelial defects something associated with the focal thinning can occasionally progress to perforation with dermatosis and the plaque formation predisposition to secondary bacterial fungal infection and to aggressive herpes simplex keratitis and keratoconus is common of about 15% which may be due to chronic rubbing 
Presenile, anterior or posterior subcapsular cataract are common. High lip margin carriage of staphylococcal RS. Cataract surgery carries increased risk of end of thalmitis. When coming to the treatment, the amount of PKC does not differ from that of AKC, but later is less responsive and requires more intensive and prolonged treatment. General measure includes uh, we can avoid allergen if possible, cold compressors, lid hygiene, and bandage contact lens wear to aid healing of persistent epithelial defects. Local treatment involved mast cell stabilizers we discussed before sodium chromoglycate, monochromic sodium, reduce the frequency of acute exacerbation and the need for steroids. Topical antihistamines like amidastin, epinastin, as effective as mast cell stabilizers, are suitable for acute exacerbations but not for continuous long term use. Combined antihistamine and vasoconstrict may offer relief in some cases. Combined antihistamine mast cell stabilizers like olapetidine relatively rapid onset of action. NSAIDs like ketorola prove comfort by blocking non histamine mediators. Topical steroids fluoromethylone 0.1, prednisolone 0.5%, 0.2 or 0.5%, severe exacerbations of conjunctivitis and significant keratopathy, reducing the conjunctival activity lead to corneal improvement. Steroid ointment like hydrocortisone 0.5% may be used to treat the eyelids, but the duration should be minimized and IOP to be monitored. Antibiotics may be used in conjunction with steroids in severe keratopathy to prevent or treat bacterial infection. Acetylcysteine is a mucolytic agent that is useful in VKC for dissolving mucus filaments. Immunomodulators like cyclosporin 0.95 to 2% may be indicated if steroids are ineffective. And the supratarsal steroid injection may be considered in severe palpable disease. And in system treatment, Oral antihistamines can be given, which helps in relieving itching and adrenal eye rubbing. Antibiotics like toxicillin 100 mg, acetromycin 500 to reduce the blepharitis, usually in AKC. Impressive agents like steroids, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, azathioprine may be effective at relatively low doses. And others like allergen desensitization. Plasma pharesis in patients with high serum Ig levels. This is okay. We discussed this, so we can move on. Here I have uh, presented with the difference in ACC, PAC, VKC, AKC in a single table. Presentation: It is intermittent in ACC, persistent in perineal, uh, persistent with intermittent exacerbation in VKC, chronic pres presentation in atopic, and seasonal. It is very frequent. Compared to perineal, both VKC and AKC are rare. And coming to the age group, seasonal, it occurs in younger children. And also PAC, uh, it affects younger children. In VKC, as we said before, it affects the boys of 5 years onwards. And in AKC, it affects adulthood with a peak incidence of 30 to 50 years. SAC was during spring and summer. And PAC symptoms throughout the year worse during the autumn. VKC, it is seasonal, but it's worse in late spring. AK is perennial and worse in winter. Coming to the allergic mechanism, both SAC are simple allergic conjunctivitis, um, IG mediated. In VKC, it is IG mediated and cell mediated. In AKC, IG and non-IG mediated. In the clinical presentation, both SA, simple allergic conjunctivitis, watering, itching are present. In VKC, itching, burning sensation as man said stingy discharge will present. In AKC, atopic asthma are present. Coming to the lid involvement, perineal may may not have palpable edema, but in VKC and AKC, uh, in VKC, mild lid edema is present. In AKC, meibomitis, blepharitis, and extra lid fold are present. In conjunctiva, Simple allergic conjunctivitis, mild papillary hyperplasia is present. In VKC, hyperemia, diffuse papillary hypertrophy, which is more common, in, uh, which is uh, which occurs in superior tarsal plane. 
in akc diffuse conjunctival infiltration scarring which occurs in inferior tarsal plate so corneal involvement is not in uh, simple allergic conjunctivitis and in vkc punctate erosions which are seen in superior cornea whereas in akc it is in inferior third cornea limbus may be thicken and harner trotter's dots are present in vkc in akc limbus may or may not thicken and harner trotter's dots may or may not present vascularization is vkc but is more common in atopic keratoconjunctivitis and then coming to the treatment allergic allergen elimination mast cell stabilizers and antihistamines can be given in uh, seasonal allergic conjunctivitis and in uh, perennial allergic conjunctivitis allergy allergen elimination mast cell stabilizers antihistamines and oral antihistamines can be given for severe symptoms in vkc mast cell stabilizers antihistamines topical steroids and oral antibiotics cyclosporine can be given in akc it is less responsive and requires more intensive and prolonged treatment that's okay that i think is fine yeah. next this is the last slide or yes no yeah so basically when we talk about akc if we have to differentiate it from vkc like we discussed it is the age uh it is usually presents at a later age group and second and most important is the scarring they will usually have scarring they are more severe there will be some amount of lead involvement in these patients and invariably to control the disease activity you will have to put these patients on oral immunosuppressors now because uh, it is either ig mediated or non ig mediated is the type 4 sensitivity reaction which is t cell dependent so most commonly the immunosuppressive that is used is a t cell inhibitor which is your tacrolimus or your cyclosporine so that usually is done with the help of an immunologist or a dermatologist or a pediatrician allergy specialist who will take care of the dosing of the um, of the immunosuppressive that you're giving with so akc is a more severe form of the allergic conjunctivitis where you'll have scarring you might because the inflammation is so severe that you can have patients presenting with cataracts you might have patients presenting even with a retinal detachment in patients with akc so uh, oral immunosuppressive plays an important role in managing patients with atopic keratoconjunctivitis as compared to when we see vkc other than that most of the times the signs and symptoms are very similar uh, the cobblestone papillae ht dots everything you will see in akc the papillary reaction that we see usually in the upper tarsal in the vkc are also seen in patients with the, in the lower tarsal conjunctiva for akc why that happens we really don't know why uh, papillary reaction is more significantly seen in the lower conjunctiva with akc we also don't there is no particular uh, rationale uh, to that and the other differentiating part when you come uh, differentiate it from your uh, seasonal or uh, perennial is usually seasonal and perennial will never have a corneal involvement once the cornea gets involved it is definitely a vkc or an akc they are dealing with your seasonal and your perennial allergic conjunctivitis will never have a corneal involvement so any question anybody has hello ma'am i have one doubt ma'am the yeah. name of the shield ulcer is it because of the shape of the ulcer ma'am or yeah. something else yeah so one it is an oval shaped ulcer two it is usually present under the upper lid so it's present in the superior part of the cornea which gets covered by the upper lid so these are the two probable reasons that why it's why it is called a shield ulcer so more, one more doubt ma'am Uh, is there any contraindication for the um, olapatid in androl, especially under one year of age? See, first of all, though you will not have VKC and AKC in less than three to four years of age because by the time the immunity develops in a child, it is at least one year to twelve, eighteen uh, months. You know, the immune, the actual immune uh, system of the child doesn't develop before that, which is why you don't usually see an allergy component before that. okay ma'am so and to uh, because of that i haven't seen or treated a patient of an allergic conjunctivitis which was less than 3 years age so i have no personal experience neither have i read any literature where it says there is contraindicated to use olopatadine before that so i don't know and i don't think there is anything in olopatadine which could be an issue for using because again systemic absorption after topical use is something which is very minimal Okay, okay, ma'am. One more doubt, ma'am. I have, uh, uh, ma'am. The 
signs of uh, this chronic allergy you know mam conjunctival scarring corneal scarring um those things are there in uh, um, some stages of trachoma also you know mam is it uh, act as a confounding or is it the trachoma itself a historical thing or is it there in our country mam so what, what is trachoma that is infective only mam okay so what happens in trachoma trachoma is uh, post infection there will be uh, that um, conjunctiva there will be um, scarring conjunctival um, uh, trichiasis mm-hmm. trichiasis in the lid and uh, uh, conjunctival uh, that trachoma follicularum trachomatis trichiasis uh, and the cicatricial stage the different stages following the oh, what is there at the limbus and what is there what are the other ocular features of trachoma you're not talking about the active trachoma correct herbert speaks no no correct ha so what happens in a chronic stage of trachoma the patient is coming to you with a chronic trachoma what scarring, are the severe scarring will be severe there scarring scarring oh, yeah. is broad term oh, yeah. and conjunctive also no ma'am tarsal conjunctive what else what are the classical what is the herbert speaks ma'am excellent herbert speaks second what is the tarsal scarring that you see What is the tarsal scarring called that you see in trachoma? Tarsal green appearance. There is some yeah. line. Yeah. See some line. Mm-hmm. Arts line. Arts line. Yeah. Yeah. What you see is a supra superior tarsal scarring called as the arts line. And yes. in limbus, you will see Herbert Spitz. Where is in BKC? What do you see in limbus? Corner. Corner. Correct. Second. uh trachoma uh, so you have to differentiate trachoma from akc correct because yes, scarring cannot happen in vkc so that is out okay ma'am akc and uh trachoma so now tell me what are the symptoms of trachoma and what are the symptoms of akc how does now we have finished the class gemini right so what, yes, what did vignesh tell us how do patients with AKC present. What are the symptoms that they present with? I'm not talking about the signs. Severe, uh, severe itching. Um, then mm-hmm. severe discharge, mm-hmm. and patient will have uh, that is. Um, they'll have itching. They'll have a little bit of ropey. Ropey discharge is again a sign. It is not a symptom. Yeah. Correct. Yes. What yes. is the symptom I'm talking about? Itching. You said one second. Watering. Photophobia. Photophobia. Right? Not. Okay. okay. Symptoms we present in a patient of chronic trachoma. I'm not sure, ma'am. So trachoma. We just. So why does itching happen? Itching due to the histamine release, ma'am. Primarily. In trachoma, is there histamine? No, ma'am. No, it is infective. Will there be, where will will there be itching in trachoma? Less likely, ma'am. It is infective. So. Infective. Very good. So that is how you have answered your question. Trachoma is an infection which has occurred one time. in that person's life and has left behind tell tale signs yes. akc is a constant disease which the patient has it's a chronic active disease so the patient will have recurrent redness recurrent photophobia recurrent watering recurrent itching the primary symptom if you have itching it is allergy if you don't have itching it is not allergy so that is the first differentiating symptom trachoma is a chronic disease where you have tell tale signs understand so that is the first criteria that will help differentiate yes ma'am you not you won't be able to mix or get confused between a trachoma and an akc very unlikely okay okay ma'am we only will tell you uh, uh, the history itself will uh, resolve the doubt if you have okay okay ma'am okay thanks ma'am most well anybody else chalo good then i think we can call it a day uh yeah. thanks vignesh you did an excellent job good no, thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you. you.